Friends, our second lesson today comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and it can be found on pages 635 and 636 in your pew Bible. Let us together listen for the voice of God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, and each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs, the seraph with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. The word of the Lord Thanks be to God. On this Trinity Sunday, there may not be a more perfect text than this mysterious text from the vision of the prophet Isaiah. In the presence of God, the text says, the prophet recalls that the very ground trembled at the sound. And Isaiah finds himself surrounded by the experience and engulfed in the mystery. And out of this mystery, the seraphs, the winged heavenly creatures, sing a song that is Trinitarian in its form. Its refrain is probably familiar to our ears, for their song has given birth to many of our own hymns and anthems, some of which are part of our worship experience today. According to the prophet, The heavenly choir sings, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. Isaiah's response is one of humility and unworthiness at the sight of it all. And the climax of the scene is when one of the seraphs flies to Isaiah with a blazing hot coal and touches his lips. Isaiah receives the assurance of pardon and an invitation to no longer stand outside of the mystery of God looking in, but to participate in its mysterious unfolding. Now, no matter how much we find scenes like this one to be intriguing, there is something else that I think we must confess. Texts like this are also disturbing to our human sensibilities. There's something about the mystery of it all that disquiets us. It doesn't fit in with our deeply ingrained desire to figure things out in their entirety. We all long to have a complete grasp on all of the details. We like to dissect anything into its smallest parts in order to come to a full working knowledge of the whole. And from the text from Isaiah we may find ourselves wondering things like, I wonder what the robe looked like. Or, how big was this temple exactly? What type of throne was it? Was it made of stone or wood? And what kind of incense were being used? Or, why do the seraphs have six wings? It would seem that two would suffice. And exactly what is a seraph anyway? We have this innate and insatiable desire to find clarity and certainty. And this human tendency has served us well throughout time. It has led to discoveries and advancements in nearly every field imaginable. But it also has its shortcomings. It drives us to buy into the idea that we must always, everything, fully 
figured out. And in an attempt to do so, we box everything in and place everyone and every experience in a nice, neat little category. But the thing about passages such as this one from Isaiah, the problem with the divine, if you will, is that we can't ever fully get our minds around them. They defy characterization, categorization, and complete understanding. And this is perhaps never more fully on display than it is on this Sunday, the Sunday we call Trinity Sunday, full of mystery. Now, even though we have our struggles with mystery, we also know that it can be found everywhere around us. In fact, it is the way of every relationship. Think about it. The deeper in relationship we find ourselves, the more mysterious the relationship is, and the one with whom we are in relationship with becomes. It's counterintuitive. Maybe the most dangerous moment in any relationship is when we allow ourselves to believe that we have the other completely figured out. We are at our best when we realize that this is true. Yet we often act as if it isn't true at all. It's so easy to fall back into that longing for certainty and clarity and control. We want the people around us and the situations in which we find ourselves to always perform, to always behave, and to always be exactly the way in which we want them to be or the way in which we imagine they should be. This is also what we do with the divine, with God, with Trinity. In our religious life together, we have come to believe that we need to fully grasp the mystery of God in order to be considered a person of faith. And this can result in religious animosity, dangerous tribalism, cultural wars, even with those who claim to follow the same path, even within our own bodies. We, we see this danger being fleshed out all around us. There's little generosity and grace in the desire to completely control. And as a result, our religious experience, our faith journey, our existence in the world becomes more constrictive than it is life-giving. So this morning, on Trinity Sunday, I'm going to explain to you exactly what... No, I'm not. (laughs) Anyone that would ever try to do such a thing is fooling themselves. They couldn't ever do that even with a month of Sundays. So what I would like to actually do in the next few moments is to dwell together in the mystery that is Trinity. And to catch a glimpse of the potential implications this idea of Trinity has for our lives of faith. To open us up to mystery. And perhaps along the way we'll discover something important about ourselves, about each other, and maybe even about God. For years, decades really, I have found myself captivated by the artistry, the beauty, the story, and the mystery found in iconography. The way in which these magnificent works point beyond themselves is moving to me. They come in various sizes and styles. They come from all over the world, and they have a wide range of subject matter. They've been a part of the worship experience for our Orthodox siblings for almost 2,000 years. In the middle of the 15th century, Russian iconographer Andrei Rublev painted an icon that has had lasting influence. It is considered by many to be the most influential icon of that time period. It's often referred to as the hospitality of Abraham, depicting the story of the visitation of the heavenly visitors to Abraham and Sarah. But the icon is more commonly known as Trinity. In your bulletin, you have a copy of that icon. I'd like for you to take it out. You can also look at the one that's right here. In this image, you can see three figures representing the three persons of the Trinity. On your left is God the Sovereign, the Creator of all things. God is wearing a translucent, ethereal gold robe. 
On your right is the Holy Spirit, the sustainer, wearing green and blue, representing growth and divinity or earth and sky, respectively. In the center of the piece, underneath the tree, is the form of Jesus the Christ, the Redeemer. He is seen as is true in most religious art and iconography down through the ages, wearing red representing his humanity and blue representing his divinity. You may also notice that the artist has pictured the Christ with two fingers on his right hand extended, indicating the dual nature of Jesus, his divinity and his humanity. There are three additional aspects of the icon to which I would like to draw your attention. While you're looking at the image, you may notice that your eye is invited into the space in between the three figures. It is as if the iconographer wants the viewer to understand the primary importance of the relationship between the three, the mystery of the Trinity, the space between. And that space doesn't appear to be a triangle at all. Instead, to be a never-ending circle. Now notice the image of the Holy Spirit who is extending their right hand and pointing to that space, almost like they're tapping the table, as if to invite her into the relationship between the three. Perhaps the iconographer wants us, the viewer, to know that there is a place, this table, for everyone. And finally, can you see the angle down at the bottom of the table? This is a very peculiar thing. When the icon was cleaned, something very interesting was discovered. The workers found that that rectangular space was covered with a sticky, glue-like residue. It was the only icon to have that residue on it. This led art historians and theologians to ponder why that might be. So they began to conjecture that perhaps there was a mirror once attached in that rectangle so that the viewer could actually see themselves participating in the divine relationship, an active part of the mystery. The artist may be telling us that not only is there a space at the table for us, but that all are invited into this divine. If we believe in such a God, a mysterious triune God, and allow ourselves to enter into this dance. Our individual lives and our life together should be... And it's mystery. Such a community, there's unity. Not sameness. Not uniformity. Charity. Characterized by deference to one another and sacrifice of self for the sake of the other unity, diversity is celebrated, each one distinguishable from the other. This diversity doesn't frighten, rather this diversity and honoring of individual personhood is the strength of the life of the other. Here, quality is the rhythm way in which the divine function, we should function. What we seek for one another. Here, all belong and are included and celebrated. No exceptions, no boundaries, no dividing lines, no exclusions, no hierarchy, no false binaries. All are included. And holding this all together is love, center. 
And this radical love is for is without limits. This love enfolds and keeps us. Without love, you celebrated diversity, true equality, full and inclusion are impossible. So friends, on this Trinity Sunday, we've all been invited to participate in this generous, generative, gracious space individually and corporately. This isn't about being right or being perfect, nor is it about believing or rightly. It is a mysterious space of more than enough where all are included and where all work together for the good of the whole, the self, in a space. There's no room for exclusion. All are important. Violence in any form of space. Our children have aid. This is the space where the lion lays with the lamb, where no one is outcast, where poverty is finally eliminated, where the lame leap and the blind receive their sight, where justice and peace kiss. There's liberation and justice for black, brown, indigenous people of color. And LGBTQIA plus persons are celebrated with pride. We are invited into the movement of this triune God to participate in this divine dance with the three in one that is happening all around us. If we allow this mystery to unfold and to enfold us, Life becomes generative and gracious. Friends, the greatest and most transformative prophetic word for the world is found in its very self. And like Isaiah, our lips have been touched. Our sin has been cleansed. And Trinity invites us into the mystery of God with love at the center. To God, the mysterious three in one. Amen.